Good evening. My name is M.A. Swedland. Uh, I'm a past member of the Deerfield Energy Committee, um, but now uh, I am doing uh, some work with the Franklin County, I have to look, read this because it's such a long name, Franklin County Continuing Political Revolution Climate Change Task Force. Um, but I particularly like the name Franklin County CPR, as that works much better for me. Um, and uh, I think we are trying to revive some things and bring things back alive. So CPR makes, makes good sense to me. Um, I'm, um, Bill Cummings and I are both Deerfield residents. We're hosting this meeting. There are four, three more meetings after this, one in Greenfield, one in Shelburne Falls, and one in Orange. Um, I don't have those dates right in front of me, but they are posted in all sorts of places. So uh, hopefully um, you can pass on, if you love this presentation, which I know you will, you'll pass on the, the, the information to other people to go to one of the other meetings because for this to succeed, we need lots of people to be knowledgeable about it and working towards our, to the goal of 100% renewable. Um, so Bob Armstrong and Nancy and Bill and I are all, and maybe some other people in here, I think I recognize some people who are all part of the uh, Climate uh, Change Task Force. Um, I know Nancy, Bill and I are all retired. Um, and, uh, and so, um, and Bob, too. Bob, hey, me, hey, hey, how are you, Kristen? Um, so, uh, I wanted to introduce Barb, Bob Armstrong, who is standing in the back back there. He, he is uh, con on the Conway Select Board. He's worked on bringing broadband to Western Mass and he's also taught math at the Holyoke High School. Um, and uh, he will be doing a part of this presentation. We're gonna try and keep them brief, hopefully about 15 minutes for both he and Nancy. Um, and Nancy Hazard, who is, raise your hand, Nancy, that's good. Uh, Nancy has uh, been a, an amazing uh, leader in Greenfield for all the, amazing work that Greenfield has done towards getting almost to 100% renewable. They are probably the closest in the, in the valley to that. Uh, and as, and as a, a founding member of Greening Greenfield. Um, she also developed the annual Tour de Sol, uh, which was a, a solar car race. Race? Was it, it was a race, right? I can call it a race. Um, back in the day for Nessie, and she's been an educator, builder, and potter. So we have um, a great presentation tonight. Our agenda is up here, me talking, and then um, Nancy's going to do a presentation on 100% renewables, a road to a vibrant economy, and then um, I will do a quick introduction to Bob's uh, work uh, uh, talking about the toolkit and mass power forward. And then we'll have a question and answer period and then, uh, one, and then some brainstorming either among people, if you, there's enough of you from the same town or, or just a general kind of brainstorming depending on what the group looks like when we're done. So without further ado, Nancy, you want to come up and, and uh, talk to us? Okay. Thank you, Emily. And thank you, everybody, for coming this evening. Um, let's see, can people hear? Um, so, um, ah, this is what I have to do. So there's the, the title, what I'm going to talk about. And um, <clears throat> most of us have probably got involved in climate change stuff, be, uh, you know, that we're concerned about climate change stuff and the environment, and that's why we're here. But the point, the case that I want to make is that it's also, to change to 100% renewable is also an economic uh, a plus for all of us. And so um, money leaves our community when we purchase fossil fuels, and we can do better than that. Now, many of you have, may have already heard me ask this question. Well, actually, I'm curious how many people know, we did an energy audit in Greenfield in 2008, 
How many people already know how much money left Greenfield in 2008? How many other? Some people have heard me speak. OK. I'm glad that you don't know the answer to that question, because now I'm going to ask you. So we're a community of 17,000. So how much money do you think we spent on energy in 2008? Any wild guesses? Is we, so we're talking is we now. Is No, this is everything in town. So this is our lighting, heating our homes, our businesses, and driving our cars and getting around just everything. Municipal, too. Yeah, a municipal too. But municipal is only 2 to 4% of the total, so it's just a, it's a drip, but an important drip, but just wild guess. How many households? Uh, 8,000 households, 17,000 people. 19 How much? 19 Nine million? Zero. 19. <laughs> Nine zero. That just fell. I got this. <laughs> Make, uh, no, I think this is the part that, oh, that needs to be tighter. Okay. So, um, nine zero, nine zero, okay. Anyone else want to guess? 90 million. You know, you're amazingly close. Most people guess 15 or 20. The answer is $86 million. Then the next question that we asked ourselves was how much of that money left our community to buy the gasoline, et cetera, et cetera, and how much stayed in our community for people who were repairing the wires or taking, in our case, we have natural gas, so the pipes for the natural gas, billing us, you know, all the customer service stuff. So um, any thoughts? How much just left? 86%. Okay, that's, that's actually a little high, higher than it, than it is. It actually depends on the, the type of uh, whether you're talking electricity or oil. Um, but in any case, in our case, since we looked, we'd done the energy audit, it was $67 million left our community in 2008. So um, that, needless to say, that made us all sit up and um, our mayor at the time, uh, Mayor Forgey, um, committed to not only reducing our climate change emissions by 80%, but to reduce the amount of money that left the region for energy reasons to zero. Um, so businesses also large businesses also uh, and small businesses really understand the, uh, the um, economic advantage of sticking with the uh, Paris Accord and to, to uh, addressing climate change. So here's a couple of sentences from a letter that over a thousand businesses have signed on to that went to, um, to uh, President-elect Bush. Failure to build a low carbon economy puts American prosperity Don't you at mean risk. Trump? What? Don't you mean Trump? Did I, what did I say? Bush. Oh, Bush. Well, that was an interesting <laughs> slip. <laughs> Just thought I'd clarify. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Severe weather events cost billions. Taking the right action now will create jobs and boost U.S. competitiveness. So we have the businesses on our side. Are those Greenfield businesses you're talking about? Uh, no, these are people like um, uh, large businesses, large international corporations, that type of thing. Uh, and Johnson all of their names Johnson just left people. my head. <laughs> Johnson Johnson's one of them? Okay. They, they've committed to 100% renewables. So. Actually, another one that's committed to 100% renewables is Monsanto, just and FYI. Amazon has, <laughs> so, yeah, Monsanto. Yep. So there's, there's a lot of, of people that you might not expect to have signed on to this. Okay, so jobs. We've known this for a long time, but uh, it, jobs like the um, wind, solar, et cetera, generate a lot more jobs than using fossil fuels. So there's some statistics here of, that it generates two to nine times more jobs for every million dollars of contributions to GDP. And already, green jobs 
have surpassed the nuclear oil and coal and gas industries if you combine them all together. And in fact, I saw an email just came across my desk today that in Massachusetts, there are 105,000 green jobs right now, up 45,000 since 2010, and then it's uh, $12 billion of our economy in the state. Um, so how do we get there? How do we, uh, you know, what is that vision and, and what is it going to look like in Massachusetts? So um, um, I ran across this called the Solutions Project. You can look it up online. It's a, uh, I think, worldwide uh, approach, came out of Stanford University. And um, you can click on each state and find out how each state is going to uh, achieve their goals. How many of you ever heard of the Solutions Project? Anybody? No, okay. Um, so uh, the thing, so how do we do it? The goal is that you have to electrify everything. Sounds a little kind of counterintuitive. And, and one of the things that's interesting about it for me is I've been involved in energy stuff for, I don't know, 40 years, is that we couldn't have said this even 10 years ago. We didn't have the technology that we have today that, would, that enables us to make this transition. Um, and in Massachusetts, as it shows on the screen, uh, how they anticipate that we will meet our energy needs in the future, 30% will come from solar. And I saw a report from Conservation Law Foundation that we could get 47% of our uh, energy from solar if we use, use roofs and uh, landfills and parking lots. We don't need to put it on ag land or take down forests or anything. We, we could do it without doing that. And then the wind, um, offshore and onshore wind, but mostly offshore wind. And then there's a little bit of, there's some hydro that we have already, which probably won't increase much. And we also need to reduce our uh, climate change emissions. Oh, and by the way, as far as wind goes, the statistics on offshore wind is we have 11 times the amount of energy that <coughs> Massachusetts uses off the coast of Massachusetts. So it can be done, money, but can be done. And then um, in terms of reducing our energy use by 40%, we still use two times as much energy per person than the Europeans use. So it certainly is not impossible to do that. So our homes, um, what, our, this is an infrared picture, obviously, of a home losing a bunch of heat. Um, so how many of you have upgraded your homes recently, or people who own their, okay, great, a lot of you. So it, about um, less than a fifth of all homes have been upgraded, so if you've already done it, please talk to your neighbors and convince them that this is a great thing to do, and, and there's a lot of programs out there. Um, but how we heat our homes has changed hugely several times over the last 200 years. We started out with burning maybe 20 cords of wood a winter. And then we started, uh, we moved towards the fossil fuels. And then we started insulating. And now it's time to change again. So now we're changing and the, and the technology that's enabling us to do this is primarily what's called the air source heat pump. Some people call it a mini split. So, when you heard in the 60s, don't ever heat your house with electricity, you just forget that. We're going to heat with electricity, and it's extremely efficient. Um, we can also uh, retrofit larger buildings. So we have uh, some great people in Greenfield that have been um, retrofitting a couple of our older brick buildings. And ha they've, uh, this is a, an apartment building that was an elementary school and the goal was uh, zero net energy. They have a large solar carport. If you haven't seen it, it's right sort of kitty corner across from Foster's. Go and take a look. Um, new, sorry, this is a little fuzzy picture, but new construction is a lot easier. We know how to build zero net energy homes. This is the home of Spartan and uh, Giordano, who went to GCC, took some courses, designed a building, hired someone who'd never built a zero net energy home. They worked on it together. His house is d making more energy than it uses on an annual basis. So you don't have to be a genius to be able to do it. It's fairly formulaic at this point. 
uh, but you do need to pay attention to details. Transportation. Again, a lot of things have changed in transportation, not just in the technology of the car, for example, but also the fact that it's, you can now telecommute. You don't have to actually go. You, there's webinars. There's just a lot of things you can do where you don't actually have to travel as much. And if you have the option, if you're moving, you have the option of living close, closer where you work or, or, um, or entertainment, et cetera, uh, that's a great option. And then, of course, you can walk, bicycle. And I know we struggle out here with public transit, but we have some and could have a lot more. So um, Greenfield, what, what are, what, how is Greenfield reaping the benefits? So today, the town is saving half a million dollars on its utility bills. Now, this is the municipal side. Um, and we're also saving, the residents are saving another half a million dollars because of the energy efficiency we've done on our homes and, uh, um, and the solar we've put on our roofs. It takes a huge amount of attention to detail to achieve the, the kinds of savings that we're seeing. This is a graph of all the buildings in green, of the town-owned buildings in Greenfield. The dark blue is how many BTUs per square foot they used in 2008 before we started, before Carol Collins, who's our energy and sustainability coordinator, started working on them. And the green one is where they are today. So there's a little more work to do, but uh, it's quite common uh, I guess the goal, she tells me the goal is 50,000 BTUs per square foot. You're doing well. Her goal is 40,000 BTUs per square foot, and she's making it, and a couple of those buildings are making it, so that's exciting. The other huge uh, game changers, I would call it, um, and what Greenfield has done. How many of you have heard about community choice or aggregating your electricity and then taking it out to bid? Okay, quite a few of you. Great. So um, this can be done, but the thing that Greenfield did that was different is that after they had aggregated and, and bundled all of the electrical use in Greenfield, that includes all of us residents, they went out to, they created a, a Greenfield Light and Power and went out to bid and said, we want 100% renewably produced electricity. We want 100% green electricity. So everybody in Greenfield has green electricity, unless they choose not to. So it's, not a, it's, it's a question of you can opt out, but, you, but you, you just get it automatically. And the last two years, since, since we keep going out to bid, it kind of changes, but the last two years, 21% of the, our electricity was local, uh, locally produced renewables, what's called class one electricity. And then the rest of it actually was hydropower from uh, from, uh, not from Canada, but from Maine. And now we have electric, we, I don't know how much is going to be local as we go forward, but uh, a combination of local and Texas wind seems to be what we're going to go forward with. Okay, so um, I'm talking too slowly probably. Um, <laughs> we're getting close. We're getting real close. Oh, I, yeah, I can do that. Okay, here's something for people who are into agriculture. How many of you heard of the idea of sequestering carbon in the soil? Okay, quite, that's, yeah, that's great. So this is becoming a really important thing. So agriculture, by plowing and all this stuff, a huge amount of carbon dioxide, carbon has come out of the soil and is now in our atmosphere. The good news is, is that we can put it back. And carbon in the soil is a good thing. It makes uh, our soil better. Um, and ANOFA is, has a huge campaign around that right now, which is great. So I'm just going to say one thing about a legislation, although the um, toolkit we're going to talk about later doesn't really cover this at all. So um, Massachusetts legislation, it, we also need to, to move that forward. So there's a couple different kinds of, of legislation. There's the things that would uh, use market forces to change it, so things like what uh, fee and rebate systems or make it, creating a green bank so we, have, we can get private sector money in so we have more money to do the work that we need to do. We also need to remove barriers to the wind and solar and we need to eliminate the uh, carbon dioxide and, and uh, methane emissions. So for example, the pipeline leaks, et cetera. Um, so I'm just gonna talk about two things about barriers. Um, this is a graph of 
uh, the renewable energy that is, is on our grid, in new renewable energy that's on our grid in Massachusetts right now. So um, the thing that's really important is the, the purple in there, that's the solar. And that's all of a sudden you can see it's like taking off. The pale blue is that's wind and that's taking off. Um, and that's taking off because of legislation that has been passed. Um, also, at last year, uh, this represents 11% um, of our electricity. So if we're going to get to 100%, right now, there's what's the renewable portfolio standard says we're raising that by 1% per year. So we've got to 11. We need to go to 100. So that's, I do the math, 90 years to get to 100, right? Or 90, 89. So in order to get to where we need to go, we need to raise the renewable portfolio standard to at least 3% per year, because if we did it at 3%, we'd get there in 30 years. So that's, if you hear about that, that's a really important thing. And um, then the other issue is that in order to have a lot of renewables, in fact, to get more than 20% of the what we call fluctuating renewables, which would be wind and solar, you have control over the hydro, but uh, you need to have energy storage systems. And so that's another component of our grid that we need to advocate for on a um, legislative level. So keep the, for me, keeping the vision of where we want to go is really important. Whenever you make a decision, think about this as our goal. So let's say you're going to update your heating system in your house. Think about, don't just upgrade to a better boiler using oil. Go ahead and explore the mini splits, the electric. See if you can get to electric. And if you're buying a new car, make it both energy efficient and, and, uh, and there are uh, some electric vehicles on the market. And so um, now I'm going to turn back to you to talk about the next piece. Thank you, Nancy, for your incredible leadership in Franklin County for all the work you've done and the vision you've provided all of us for. And Greenfield is leading the way and showing us how to do it. So thank you for that. Um, the the next section is, is about Mass Power Forward. And Mass Power Forward is a coalition of 200 groups in Massachusetts that have come together. Uh, they're environmental groups, they're faith groups, they're community groups, they're sort of a whole broad group of people. And they've come together and they've basically saying, we have to do something and we have to do something now. And so they're working, as Nancy pointed out, a little bit on really looking at what's happening in the legislature and, uh, and, and, and doing some really great work. So the, uh, climate, uh, the climate change task force that we're a part of uh, is, has teamed up with Mass Power Forward. And I don't know whether you all saw, at least in the newspaper or some kind of uh, maybe you even went to it that Mass Power Forward came out to Greenfield and did a press conference because crumb, we're so incredibly good out here that they wanted to use us as an example in Franklin County. Um, so, um, but, the, but the part that we're really looking at is something that they have, a uh, uh, campaign they've started up called the 100% Renewable Towns and Cities. And what uh, the climate action uh, group is uh, the uh, uh, climate change task force group is trying to do is get pe get groups in in Franklin County in every single town to advocate for 100% renewable in their town, and that's that's our sort of big ask here today, um, and at the other four meetings is can we set up a t team in each town that can advocate for this, put together a plan hopefully get a, a, a town vote to commit to it. It's a non -bind, it would be non-binding, but that's what it would be. Um, and and um, if we could do that, 
that would be, I mean, we would be really providing incredible leadership in, in, in the state. So Bob is going to talk about the, um, what, what they call their toolkit uh, on, on the uh, Cities and Towns campaign. And um, after that, we'll have a quick question and answer period and then some brainstorming. So Bob, you want to come on up? So I do have some handouts. I printed out six copies of part of the toolkit. I'm going to give them out. I don't have enough for everyone. They're online. I don't like printing out lots of paper. Um, you don't actually have to get a copy, but I just wanted to print it out to show you what it is. All of the pages from the toolkit that we're going to talk about are going to be slides. So. So Franklin County CPR is an organization that we created from a lot of people that worked hard on the Bernie Sanders campaign. And after the Democratic primary, when that role was over, we thought about what we wanted to do next. And what we decided was there were a lot of things that we had all pushed for that were kind of part of the campaign. And so we created an organization uh, it's, it's a Franklin County based organization, but we created Franklin County CPR to do work on all of those projects. And so we created task forces to work on different projects. We, we had a big meeting uh, where we had people come and vote on what were the top projects that they wanted to work on. So we're working on things like, and I won't even remember them all, but, but climate change, education, uh, single payer health care, Medicare for all. Uh, uh, labor, what else? Things like that. So you get the idea. And so people could join any one of these or two of these, whatever they wanted to work on, and then each of those groups meet separately and uh, determine projects that they wanted to work on. And so our real focus, and it really feels like we're doing something kind of different than other groups, is we're just really doing projects. Well, some of those projects might be to write postcards and contact legislators and things like that, but in the climate change group, we have different projects that we decided we're going to work on. And what I wanted to work on as the new selectman in Conway was I think a lot about how to make our town do things that they're not currently doing and, or how to help them do things that I think are good. And I wanted to work on things having to do with towns. And so we talked about that in the, in the climate change meeting that we had, and Nancy, who was there, said, I know just the project. And so Mass Power Forward, we're going to talk about them, Mass Power Forward had created a statewide project where towns can use a toolkit they created uh, to evaluate their town and think about the kind of projects that they might want to work on. And so we looked at their project, it looked wonderful, um, and so we had, they, had a, they came out to Greenfield and did a press conference, as M.A. said, and they did two press conferences in the state, one of them was in Greenfield. Beca and I can tell you the people in Amherst and Northampton were not happy that they held it in Greenfield. Uh, uh, they also held, held one in eastern Massachusetts. So, so I'm going to talk about the toolkit that they created, um, so, sort of the, how I imagine it working. But this is, the, you know, we're just starting, we're kind of wading into this project. If you have ideas, we would love to hear about them. Every town is going to be doing it a little bit independently. I've, so. Um, you know, you, you will be the, the drivers for how this project goes. So, so, I'm, so I'm thinking of, this is the project that we're working on. The cast of characters are going to be working on it. So we're thinking of the energy committees, the select boards in our towns are going to be key because you were the guys, and I don't know how many people here are on their town energy committee, I see a, a bunch of ours, but we view the energy committees as being really key for um, doing a little bit of the work with hopefully volunteers that we can provide for you, and, uh, and uh, then, then, then recommending projects up to the select boards. Uh, we can hopefully help you find funding for some of these projects. And, um, and Mass Power Forward is a group that created 
this toolkit and create and is, and is organizing and is sort of organizing this project across the entire state. So right about now, there are towns all across Massachusetts that are thinking about this project and how to do it in all of their individual towns. So some of these are big cities. There's things in the toolkit that have to do with, you know, with, with big cities as opposed to Hawley, or, you know, or, or even Conway. You know, there's a, there's a wide range in all of our cities. So Mass Power Forward, as I MA mentioned, it's a, it's a coalition of about 200 different energy groups. A lot of the energy groups you might have heard of now, this is the very top of a really, really long list. You can look at it online of all of the groups that are there. But uh, some of the bigger ones are Clean Water Action, uh, Massachusetts Climate Action Now, groups like that. Uh, 350.org or 350 mass.org. Uh, and then Mass Energy, I don't know if you've heard of them, but there's, there's, there's a, a huge number of, of climate change related groups across the state. Mass Power Forward uh, got created to kind of have communication between all of them and also to give the legislators somebody to try to talk to with one voice. So Mass Power Forward, this is their website, mapowerforward.com. Uh, not after you, MA, I think, but it's pretty close. I take credit for everything in the state. It's great. And, and if you go to mapowerforward.com, you will see 100% renewables as one of their headers. You can click on that, and then you can find the toolkit. So what, the, what, what this project is about, and it's what, and what Nancy just talked about, is how do we move towards 100%? And yes, the goal might be to reach 100%, and that's a pretty tough goal. And so you know, I really view it as a journey, and we're starting on the journey, and maybe eventually we're going to get to 100%. And if we don't get to 100%, what if we get to 80%? You know, in, in the next 10 years, 20 years, whatever it's going to be, well, that's a lot better than where we are now. So, so think of this as what can we do to get started on this journey towards 100%? And how do we change 100%? Well, a percentage, percentage is a fraction. I was a math teacher. I like fractions. I like math. And so, so think of this as the amount of renewable energy that your town uses divided by all of the energy that your town uses. And so if you don't use any renewable energy, you're at zero. But you are using renewable energy because today 11% of the energy, the electricity that you buy from Eversource is renewable. So at least that amount of energy is what today you could put in the numerator of this fraction. And then how can you make that number bigger? So, so when you ask kids that, they think about that, and it's a little confusing maybe, but, but if you make the denominator of a fraction smaller, it makes the value of the fraction larger, right? So, so if we can lower the total amount of energy that we're using, we're approaching 100%. And that's what we think of if you think of insulating your home, uh, buying a more efficient, uh, better miles per gallon car, um, all things like that. Um, and then if you increase the amount of renewable energy, that's also moving towards 100%. So renewable energy, you know, here's some shots of renewable energy. I don't know if you recognize the hydro dam down at the bottom. I think that's a dam number five on the Deerfield. It's a little bit north of Shelburne Falls. Um, uh, the upper white one isn't my home, but I have a tracker that looks just like that. It's, you know, it's a great way to make electricity. Um, a lot of people put uh, solar on their home. And, and the lower left one is actually a picture from Cape Wind. We have, we have a lot of wind, a wind farm down off the Cape, and hopefully there's more of them coming. So increase renewable, um, and then decreasing your energy use. And so the way we all think of that is you know, insulate your home, put in lead light bulbs. Uh, you can always blow in more insulation up in your attic, uh, sealing all of your windows and doors, uh, sealing your garage door if you have a heated garage. Uh, this is a, a high efficiency hot water heater, uh, it, it, you know, and, uh, and, and then a mini split is, uh, is, is in the lower right. Uh, it, ha it has a, a, an efficient, um, what's the right word, uh, the thing outside, uh, heat a heat pump outside that basically takes heat or cool from the air and then, and then 
uh, carries it along a pipe that comes into the little thing that's in your house. And, and right today, you can actually have a heat pump that can efficiently take heat out of the air when it's about 35 below zero outside. So the efficiency of these things has really changed. You know, my parents, when they retired, they moved down to Florida and everybody had a little heat pump outside their house and they were, you know, they were about the size of that screen and they didn't work very well if it got at all cold and the, the efficiency of heat pumps today is unbelievable. So there's a lot of things that we could do. We can, we can do any of those things. We could, we could install some, we can work on getting, moving our town towards more renewable. We could move our town towards using less energy and how do we decide what to do? So this is what that first page of that toolkit looks like made by Math Power Forward. <coughs> so, so now I'm gonna just go through a few of the pages that are, or the part of some of the pages to give you a look at what this is, but I really encourage you, go online, mapowerforward.com, you know, look at it online, download it if you like to print things out. Um, but I wanted to show you just what some of it looks like. It's very approachable. So this is what the table of contents looks like. Um, you know, and it, and, and it talks a little bit about why moving to renewables is important, which is a lot of what Nancy talked about. And then they talk about goal one as passing a non-binding resolution. At the time we got the project going, we really didn't have time, we thought, and probably don't, to have put these all on our, on our warrants and, you know, to get them to pass a town meeting. But, you know, the, but starting with goal one, they say you should start with either of these goals and goal two is to actually work on some projects. And so we all thought that it would be better if we started some projects, could get our town moving to say, hey, we can really do this. And then, you know, maybe next year or sometime in the future when a lot of people have worked on the project and are involved, we could move towards goal one and pass a non-binding resolution. I don't know about you, but in my town, non-binding resolutions don't carry much weight. So, so goal two is how to implement some of these projects. So we're going to talk about that. So these are the two goals, a non-binding resolution and do some projects. We're, we're, uh, we're going to work on goal two. So the way that they recommend, you know, working on these concrete projects is go through and look at the toolkit, get used to what it says, and then a lot of it is an assessment of your town. It asks a bunch of questions. Have you done this? Has your town done that? And you can check yes, no, my town did it, my town didn't do it. And then based upon what your answers are, they have recommendations of the kind of projects you might want to consider next. And then you would get together with your energy committee or maybe the energy committee is actually doing this and you would decide These are the pro this is the project we want to work on next. Pick a project. There only has to be one. You know, pick something that you think you could do. So this is an example of the checklist. And it's, this is all, all in that thing I handed out. It's all in what you'll download. So if you look, here's an example of what some of the things are that we might think about. Has your town done this? Has your town done an ener energy audit? Like Nancy talked about, they did an energy audit in Greenfield. They sort of looked at where do we use energy? Well, it gives you a good handle on where you might think about saving energy. Um, have you implemented, uh, did you, have you put in lead light bulbs? Uh, have you put in more efficient heaters or air conditioning in some of your town buildings? So these are all town focused. Has your town done this? One of the ones that's not, in their assist, that's not on their, their list very much is how has your town encouraged people in the town to participate in mass save? So Mass Save is a program we all pay. When you pay your electric bill, you contribute toward a big pool of money. That money it gets spent for you when somebody comes to your house and they'll install your lead light bulbs. They'll seal your house. They will do a lot of evaluations of your home for free and do a lot of work for you absolutely for free. They might say, gee, you have a really old and efficient electric hot water heater or a gas hot water heater, you could save a lot of money by putting in a more efficient hot water heater. I have a bunch of friends in Conway that got an electric hot water heater almost for free through Mass Save. And they installed it. Um, so, so these are the kind of questions that are in the toolkit. Um, and we're going to look at a couple more of them. 
So these are things that the things in your, in your town. Has your town thought about doing these things? Do you have an energy committee? I think all of our towns in the frontier region anyway all have energy committees because we're all green communities. But there are like six towns in Franklin County that are not green communities that don't have an energy committee. So it talks about if you're not a green community, think about becoming a green community and it gives you advice on how to do that. Uh, you know, how to apply for grants to, to uh, part of being a green community is doing some upgrades and they give you money to do those upgrades. Uh, They, uh, what kind of energy do you purchase? You know, d does your town have any kind of, do you purchase any green energy? Nancy talked about the fact that Greenfield buys um, its own, uh, a, a sort of a special blend of green energy through a provider. Your town could, so you could do what's called aggregation, which means you would go to a, a buyer and they would provide everyone in your town a standard um, mix of energy that would be more efficient, um, that would have more renewables than what you're getting from Eversource. And, 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 and what Greenfield is doing is utterly amazing. They're buying 100% renewable, 21% class one, which is 10% higher than the law requires, at a penny less than what Eversource is selling you your electricity. At about eight cents a kilowatt hour, you're paying about over nine or nine and a half cents per kilowatt hour. So, so um, I believe with a little coaxing, all of us in Franklin County might be able to work with Greenfield to have them lead us into aggregating our town and using the expertise of what they've learned through their experience aggregating Greenfield. And the company they buy electricity from is probably will go along with that, will help us. And then we, we might, whether we could get the same deal Greenfield has, I don't know, because they buy a lot and we would buy a smaller amount, but we'll see. So you've gone through the checklist, you've read through all of the questions, you checked off, yes, I do this, no, I didn't do that, yes, I did this. Just count up the number of check marks. It's kind of like getting a grade when you're in school. And then so if you've only, if you've counted up one to seven check marks, you're a town and I suspect some of our towns are gonna to be just getting started. You're really early on the, on the path towards getting to 100% renewable. If you count eight to 15 check marks, then you would rank yourself, you know, you're on the way, you have a ways to go yet, but you're well on the way. And Greenfield probably is in the last group. That means you're a very active town, you've done a lot of the work, towards 100% renewable, but again, they have a bunch of projects that they recommend. So, so this is an example of some of the projects that they have. And so I put, I put in some of the projects for our beginner towns because I suspect most of us will be beginner towns. And it's things like, like do a greenhouse gas inventory. Where do you use electricity? Where do you use power today? All different kinds, gas, uh, you know, oil, uh, electricity, where do you use energy? Um, and doing, do an energy efficiency audit of some of your big buildings, doing the, the schools, looking at the elementary school in your town, looking at Frontier, where do they use energy? How might they use energy more efficiently? Um, join the Green Communities Project. Many of, if you're a beginner town, we're getting there. I, I'm hurrying, yep, almost done. So. So, 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 so this is all in this toolkit. They give you some nice things to read about why it's a good idea. They give you a checklist that you can check off for your town. They uh, give you recommended projects based on where you are. Um, now, it may be that you may be a beginner town and if you look through some of the intermediate town projects, you might say, gee, that's a project I think we could do. The one that I think is, is this community choice aggregation. You know, you might decide, gee, we're a beginner town, but we could start completely independently and in looking at aggregating our electricity, buying renewable electricity, if it's at the same cost and what we get from Eversource. Uh, in the end of the toolkit, there's some other resources you can look at. So for each of the projects that we're talking about, aggregation or, or mass save, um, they have, they have a page or two of detail about ways that you might think about doing that. 
doing a greenhouse inventory, becoming a green community, uh, making your municipal buildings more efficient. So they have a bunch of links that are on that page. Here's, here's, the, here's the link for getting to the page. It's, it's mapowerforward.com. Oh, I left off the .com. Got to fix that. And then, and then it's, it's 100 RE for 100% renewable. So, so it's, you go to that page, you'll see the toolkit, and you'll see a whole lot of other links for individual projects. And then the other goal is, what I really hope is that, well, for one thing, we're all going to have fun, and uh, we're all going to get to know each other. You know, I, I, I don't want you to think this means that a bunch of disgruntled volunteers are going to, you know, rage into your energy committee meetings and demand that you do stuff. You know, I, I think there are a lot of people that care about renewable energy. Um, maybe you can get some more volunteers to join the energy committees. I think that would be great. But, uh, but right now, there are a great many people who care about climate change, and uh, we hope to get other people involved. Green, you got a question? No. Oh. Oh. A comment. I have. I have a comment. Oh, can, can, can you hear me? Yep. You? Well, you know, I'm just, I'm just going to talk because it's such an intimate. I can turn. There's one thing that's missing from this equation. We're all talking about, re I feel like I'm preaching to the choir because we all are on the same, we got to do something. Uh, there's one thing missing from the equation is consumption. We talk about renewables, we talk about energy efficiency, you know, reduce our, our requirements in our homes, but consumption is rampant. And I know none of us are really guilty of unnecessary consumption, but this is something you've got to start talking up. <clears throat> if we reduce our consumption of goods, if we don't buy strawberries in February that have food miles 3,000 miles away in California, this is going to help the issue. So I just want to make a note of, it's not just renewables, it's not just energy efficiency, it's consumption. Thank you. Good point, Reedy. Thanks, Thank Reedy. Reedy is a member of the Deerfield Energy Committee. Uh, uh, none of us are going to argue with you at all. Yeah. You know, you're exactly right. Uh, yeah, but what we're trying to say is that we, this is a specific project that we want to work on. There are a great many things. I mean, we're not talking about write to your legislators and pitch certain bills. We're not talking about trying to get people to change their habits. These are all things that I think we can do and not expect people to change their habits very much and, and make a difference. And, and all of the people should change their habits, absolutely. But. Um, I need a better understanding of the aggregation component of this, how it works within a town, and is it possible, as a second question, for towns to aggregate together as well? Uh, I'm not an expert at this, but um, I will say that it's complicated. <laughs> it is not a simple thing. Um, what Greenfield did is they hired a consultant to help with them. and help them with it and in our case it took two years it uh, they we, we it had to go through um, the division of energy resources we had to go to the DPU we it, to create the entity etc cetera, etc cetera. having said all of that um, because of the fact that Greenfield has been through that experience I know that Carol Collins who's our energy and sustainability coordinator who worked with our consultant, which was Peregrine Energy, um, they've expressed some interest in holding some workshops on how to do it. Um, I asked at one point if there was any way the little or smaller towns could join Greenfield. I'm not sure that that's possible. I think there's some rules and regulations that, so I'm hoping to, that we can have that meeting soon and you can hear from the experts. Could this be something that maybe we talk to the FERCOG about? That they could help with that. Yeah, I think the key thing is um, is is just uh, trying to get those two people's time <laughs> for them to agree to do this. Um, I know that some other people have been uh, doing this kind of meeting down in the uh, Amherst Northampton area. Um, so so uh, there's a number of people looking at it, and there's different I guess some different ways of approaching it. So the idea of aggregation is simple, but you know, like everything else, the, the details are complicated. The, the idea is you find a provider of electricity that will 
provide your entire town with electricity um, automatically. And, and so right today, you could choose any provider you want to provide your electricity. You just really need to call them up and say, I would like you to be my provider, and you will then be buying electricity from them instead of Eversource. Yeah, you can do that as an individual, but you can't do that as a town. Right. But so, so, so the idea the of getting energy from somebody else is, it has been around since the, the mid-90s. Is that right? 96, mm -hmm. I think? 97 or something, yeah. 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 And, uh, and, 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 so you, and, and if you go online, uh, if you go to the Eversource webpage and you can find a link there that will say who else could I buy electricity from and they're helpful um, and you know that the, your bill then will have your electricity coming from somebody else but your distribution charges all still go to Eversource they're still a big piece of more than half of your bill still goes to Eversource they own the wires and they're demanding the the rate increase that's going through and, uh, but, but your actual electricity charge, the person you're paying nine and a half cents per kilowatt hour or whatever they charge, won't be Eversource, it will be somebody else. Aggregation is sort of a way of having that occur for everyone in your town uh, automatically. And then people would get a letter saying, you know, do you want to opt out of this aggregation? And you could stick with Eversource if you want. Um, if you are already going with a unique provider or somebody other than Eversource, you wouldn't be part of the aggregation. You would be left with the provider that you currently have. So, 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 that's what, so aggregation, the idea of it is simple, but in general, you know, since towns don't know what they want, uh, you generally go with, hire a company to come in and help you do it. And I think that I'm hoping that we can avoid that by getting Carol's help and going with Peregrine and having, getting the same kind of aggregation that Greenfield has, whether we're actually officially part of them or not, I don't know. And Carol has said she'd get together with some of the energy committees and talk about it. Should be. Sure. Is this on? No. Yeah. Yeah, good. I have to say that was the best information I've heard, period, because you have people Come, come to you and say, oh, I can get you cheaper energy. You'll, you know, get it through the smaller company, company um, but it will still go through Eversource. And you're like, well, why do I trust you? But you now have given me a piece of information that has been missing from all this conversation that's nowhere that I can go to Eversource and I then have the power to pick and choose and have the same benefits that these friends or salesmen are telling me. So worthwhile thank you so much everybody pay attention to that <laughs> <laughs> I'll just add that the uh, you will always uh, Eversource is has the responsibility to bill you for both the distribution and the energy side so you will always have a, a single piece of paper that has all the charges on it so that that can also be very confusing Nancy correct me if I'm wrong uh, Eversource or any utility passes through the supplier. They don't. They don't make money on that. That's just basically That's a pass through. Mm -hmm. So um, where they make money is on the distribution side of that bill, and they make plenty. <laughs> <laughs> any other comments or questions? Yes. Yeah, I have a question. Um, I'm from the Northfield Energy Committee, and we're doing a lot around municipal buildings, but we haven't tackled residential. And I was impressed, Nancy, that you said that you uh, were seeing $500,000 in savings, residential savings. Wondering if you could uh, share a little more detail about how you got there. Um, great question. Um, a couple, maybe five or six years ago, Greenfield uh, wrote a grant proposal to the EPA, so it no longer exists, I mean the, this particular grant. Um, and our proposal was that we wanted to do uh, marketing for the existing um, utility companies, because I think it's the marketing of the utility company, of the mass power, you know, uh, mass saves program, which is so poor. Um, and also, it's that issue of trust. So our goal was to have somebody who was not a utility person, who was not an insulation installer, that was not a PV installer, was a neutral person from the town of Greenfield that would, and we went to every single door in Greenfield. It's called the uh, Energy Smart Home Program. 
uh, and we did it for three years, um, to, to tell them about the program and to try to get them involved. So it, that's how we did that part of it, and then we also uh, were involved in a Solarize program, which many other towns have done. Okay, so are you saying that you hired a neutral person um, who helped connect people to Mass Save? Correct. Okay, and about how many households could, if it took three years, was it like 5,000 houses a year? No. Um, like everything else, uh, it's, there's still many um, stumbling blocks that we didn't resolve. So it still is maybe, maybe a fifth of the Greenfield homes have actually been changed. So what were the problems? A lot of the problem, and actually what we started out, our goal was particularly to reach low-income housing. And uh, that's incredibly difficult in many cases because of the landlord versus the renter. So you, you may speak to the renter, but you haven't reached the landlord, and uh, anyway, it goes on and on. I could, you know, I could talk to you privately about the complexity there. So um, it's not easy, but, um, or, or some, I've seen some communities where they've, they've actually done it through volunteer activities. So, you know, gone house to house and neighbor to neighbor, and uh, that's probably the most effective thing if you actually have the warm bodies that can do it. Sund I, Sunderland, Laura, do you, you want to talk about yeah. that? I'm sorry to interrupt. Okay. I don't have all the figures for you, but uh, Sunderland did that in 2014 and 15. We did two, two years. Um, we worked on it, and we used a combination of volunteers, and we hired some people to go door to door with us to, um, through the green communities. We got funding from that. Sunderland. Uh, we'd be glad to talk to any of the towns around here about our experiences. We can give you more detailed figures on what we did, but we found that we, w we knocked on every door at least once, sometimes more than t once. Um, out of all the people that we spoke to, 25% of those people actually did the home energy audits, which is a very high percentage. Mm, it's amazing. And we, we don't have figures on all the people that actually had work done, but just getting them to do the mass, sa mass saves was incredible. Yeah. And yeah. we've had so much interest from that program. So many people, and, and I'm talking door to door too, people who have had the work done, they talk to their neighbors. So we don't have any figures on how that ha you know, progressed from where we left off. But we, we gained a lot in our town. I can't tell you how much in energy, but we certainly got a lot going. And right now we're starting to work on the, the landlord problem. We're going to start speaking to people like Steve Kulik and Pete, Peter Wingate from Com Community Action, who may be able to help us determine how do we reach the low-income people. We really need to find a way to get them funded because Mass Save is only taking care of those people that aren't qualified well, for low-income. They're they're very low funding. Mm -hmm. They do not have the money. They're their backlog is extreme. They can't hire enough people. Yeah, we've been lucky in common with them. But yeah. Well, they're great people. They just have, there's a huge list. And there's a long waiting period, and people are getting frustrated. So they, they just get very upset. So we're, we're looking for more funding. So we're going outside our, our known programs and trying to get other people involved. And Steve Kulik, we've, we've already spoken to him at one of our, we had a, uh, information session uh, and ask questions for Steve and we did bring that up that we have we have the needs Sunderland's one of the poverty centers of the universe plus high rent because we have the university we have all those apartment complexes so we're we're really going to work hard to get that going probably within the next two weeks we're going to meet with mm -hmm. with Steve Kulik and Peter Wingate I think you're a, a great example for us smaller towns and what you've pulled off, so we'd love to sort of keep that communication open We have three people, people on our committee, so when you said maybe you can get some more people in, we'd love to get more people in. Yeah. So we're um, working hard on this. The, <clears throat> the Mass Save program, it, it irritated me the other night at the hearing for Eversource. They had this useless flyer, but they gave the impression that they, it was their program, 
and it's our program. We put the money in, we're, right. and they're, they're hiring third-party contractors that are actually doing the work, some of which are very good folks. Right. Um, you know, I could see where we could go through and almost do a little video if we get the right inspector from one of those. They'd be happy to help with that. And yeah. they're very competent, some of them. Right. Um, I've, I've done my house five times since the mid-70s and yeah. because parameters change. And um, you can work with these guys. You, know, you, you can do some incredible work with them and, and get a real profile of what's going on with the building. So we could probably do something like that with a limited number of experiences and then take it on the road in our community. Yeah. There was a, um, a grant proposal that came to FERCOG recently. I forget the, what it was called, but I, I sent it over. It, it struck, I looked at it and said, oh, maybe FERCOG could get some money and offer assistance, you know, sort of that organizing and informational stuff to all of the communities in Franklin County around energy efficiency stuff. Anyway, I sent it over to, to, to Peggy Sloan. And she sent it back. She said they're looking at that possibility. So um, there's another potential source of um, help anyway, not technical assistance, I guess I would call it, as opposed to actual money. But, but think about what you just said. You, you, you said with a lot of work, you got 25% of the, uh, of the people in town to have a free service come to their house and and provide them with services that they otherwise would have to pay for. And it's hardly being used. And, and I admit, I have not had Mass Save come to my house. And I don't know if that, I mean, you don't, I'm not asking for a show of hands, but you know, uh, you know, I feel like, you know, I admit I'm a slacker here and, and I should have Mass Save come to my house. We, years ago in Deerfield, we had our own land trust and we worked for three years inviting older farmers and their wives to a dinner at Eagle Brook. We'd feed them and we brought in a fellow and we'd talk about the laws and the values of doing land trust work. And it took that long, then a few people tried it, and then it wasn't too long where we were beating them away with a stick because <laughs> the list was so long. This was the APR program. Yeah, yeah. and I oh, think yeah. you could do that with the mass save in mm. the community. You, you, you use the people that were happy with it and get them on board with you. So it may be a 15 month or 25 month project, but you could keep building on that 25%. Yeah. You know, it's a process. So any other questions? It's back to the aggregation question. Um, surely the objective is to not be buying from other providers, renewable energy, but to generate it ourselves so that we don't have to deal with Eversource's, um, with Eversource period. So is there anything that we should be aware of as we move to aggregation to set up the process such that moving to local production is easier? Well, that's um, an interesting question, and that's, we were talking about how 21% uh, of Greenfield's electricity is, was local, locally produced, or at least class one uh, produced. So class one means New England. Um, and, you know, it's, it, it, it's a two-part thing. It's like we need to build more locally. So, for example, in Greenfield, we have two megawatts on our landfill, and we have whatever people have chosen to put on their homes. Um, so that's something that Greenfield can take advantage of when they're, uh, when they're purchasing electricity. So, so you need to build more, and then when you go out to bid, you just you need to ask for it. Um, I guess that's the other side of that. And actually, well, this is kind of a, a, um, an interest. When, um, when we did our audit a number of years ago, um, it turns out that our, um, the hydropower that we have in Franklin County uh, it actually generates twice as much electricity than we all use, but we don't own it. And, you know, a Canadian firm owns it. So wouldn't it be cool if we could own those hydro stations? <laughs> of course, there are issues with those hydro stations. I know they're not perfect. <laughs> but um, so that, but 
So we need to build m more local, local stuff, I guess, would sort of be my answer. And, and then, yeah. It's it's I don't think there's a conflict, though. Uh, you know, when, when you put solar on your home, to the electric company, it looks like you did a really good job insulating your home. You, you know, in other words, you, you just are buying less electricity from them. And they could probably figure it out by judging by what time of day you get your electricity, but, but really to them, it just looks like you're using less electricity. And when the town builds a, a, a solar, you know, two megawatt array in Conway, we're looking at a 250 kilowatt array. I think Sunderland has put in, what, a 300 kilowatt array next to their elementary school. It just looks like they're buying 300 kilowatt or whatever that is in hours, you know, less electricity than they used to buy. So it's not, I don't think, I, but I, you know, I'm not an expert on aggregation, but I don't think that it's directly related to aggregation. Aggregation just has to do with who you are buying your electricity from. And, and to some extent, what it's doing is it's funding the people that are making that electricity and they're putting it into the grid, but, it may, but those are not the little electrons that are coming into your house. You just get the mix of whatever Eversource is purchasing, but you're not giving any money to Eversource for that. You, you, know, you are giving money to somebody who's perhaps making it using wind or hydro or, or, uh, or solar or, uh, you know, methane from their cows or, you know, or how, however it is that they're generating their electricity. And that means you're supporting green energy. And, you know, and Nancy is saying Greenfield buys some of their energy from wind towers down in Texas. And it means that some wind tower down there is pumping a lot of electrons into the grid. And those electrons probably are not reaching New England. But they're, they're displacing electrons that would, were made by carbon if they weren't around. And so that's a good thing. So, oh, okay, yes, yeah. Sue. Um, first of all, I thought this is wonderful. I hope you go on the road, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first one we've done, so it was a little scary for us, but so thank you for being a kind audience. <laughs> uh, no, it, it, was, it was very good. And, um, the most powerful thing for me was the energy audit at the beginning of Nancy's talk that showed how much money went out of Greenfield, uh, you know, what, how much was used, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I can't imagine a town, for example, Conway, <laughs> uh, where that wouldn't be a powerful way to get action at a town meeting. Mm -hmm. This is how much money, I mean, everybody's desperate the school uses so much, the this uses so much, the that uses so much. And I think just those data, if they could be produced in a way and packaged in a way that everyone feels is respectable, would prompt action very, very I, fast. I would ask Nancy and or, some, uh, and, and or people from Greenfield to maybe give us a course on how they collected that information because it's usually, actually quite easy. In fact, you guys are a green community, right, Conway? Yeah. Yes, we are. Yes. So you already have done... Right. Well, you've already done your municipal side, but you haven't done the other side. Right. That Mass, is true. Mass Insight that yeah. has that. Yeah. Right. So you can take the municipal side and turn it into money. Yeah. Okay. Yep. I, I can tell you, actually, it's not that difficult. Okay. So um, I'd love to move into now, uh, it's quarter after. Um, I'd love to be able to be done in about 15 minutes so people can go home and go to bed. Um, and I just, uh, for, the, for the brainstorming session, I don't think there's enough people here that are from one town to make it worth breaking out. So I think we ought to just sort of brainstorm among each other sort of ideas. And I wanted to set the framework for that. And the first thing, uh, I would say is I want to talk about is the relationship between energy committees and the 100% renewables team. Um, do you want a sign up list? It just occurred to me. Oh, well, yeah, we should. I never thought about that. that. Um, um, and uh, do you have an extra? Hmm? 
I see I these. I, I see us to putting to together 100 percent renewable yeah. teams that are that are sure. supporting the energy committees, and uh, the energy committees have plenty to do. They're, 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 they've already up to their ears. But I think there's a lot of people in town who um, who could provide uh, support and planning and help the energy committees uh, and. What I was imagining this team do, doing more of than, than energy committees do is PR in town, education in town, um, community organizing, and lobbying local and state officials. I see those as sort of the big things. Where now, if you want to, if, 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 if it's going to come to getting a grant for, you know, additional grant from green communities, I think that's the kind of thing that falls to the energy committee and the town officials. But I think there's a lot of community work that these teams could do that would be a really big support. And part of that is, take, is trying to figure out doing this um, checklist and then coming up and then developing a plan with the energy committees and then selling that whatever that plan is to the select board and other relevant boards. So, and the energy committee is busy. So if, if we could form in each of these towns, form a team, um, I think that it would be, it would really kick up the level of participation and all, you know, for, for, uh, regarding uh, uh, climate, uh, climate change. Um, so right now I'm imagining us spending about 15 minutes or whatever, time people want to spend on just sort of brainstorming ideas for, um, for the kinds of things Bob has, has and, I, and I second it 100%, um, the aggregation I think is a really interesting uh, idea and I'd love to know, uh, to answer the, uh, your question about ag towns become aggregating, you know, aggregating together because it's too much work for the town of Deerfield or the town of Sunderland. Every, you know, again, nobody in town has time to follow through on that, but, but if we could take three or four towns and hire uh, a, 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 a Carol Collins, um, and, I, and I, we've talked a little bit about this in Sunderland and Waitley before, but we've never actually done it. Um, but if we could hire uh, an energy uh, manager or whatever, whatever, what's Carol's title? Whatever. Whatever. <laughs> uh, if we could hire somebody that could work with all of us, then that whole, ag the, we could, there's lots of things we could do, aggregate around and, and cooperate. And I think, I think that if we were to combine all the towns, we'd get up to a population which becomes a little more interesting. For. I just really love that idea, and I've been thinking about this for a long time, that we're all small towns, but we're headed in the same direction. But if, you know, just even for me to know of two towns that are, have done the residential is a help. You know, it's almost like a speaker's right. kind of thing, but um, it would be great to pull together and be able to hire a joint consultant or even a staff person. Right. Or, I think if we're going to move forward on this at any kind of speed, um, we need to have a staff person. And there's nobody, there's nobody currently available in the towns to do that work. They're all got full-time jobs. When we had the press conference in Greenfield a couple weeks ago, uh, and Mayor Martin spoke and was very supportive and very rightly was very proud of what Greenfield has done, and he expressed in the press conference he really can see Greenfield as taking a leadership role for the rest of the county. And so I talked to him after the meeting and said, do you really mean that? And he said, yes. And so at that meeting, I went and talked to Carol Collins, who I'd never met, and she said she would consider it. And uh, we've had a couple email exchanges, and um, I don't want to push her on our energy committee. You know, I mean, the, the, you know, I want our energy committees to be taking the lead here. Um, but I think Carol would be willing to perhaps bring somebody from Peregrine in to talk to us. And I think normally what you do is you choose a company you want to be the, uh, the company that does the work for you, and Peregrine would do it. 
And that, so I don't think it would be a lot of work on any of our parts because Peregrine would then become the company that would sell us electricity. At least I think that's the way it works, that you don't, you don't actually have to do the work yourself. Yeah. My name is Bill Ashley. I'm from Holyoke. I'm just here to listen. Awesome. I have something to contribute. Uh, I've been looking at Western Mass, all the towns, just like 101 towns, not counting Shelburne Falls, which isn't a town. Um, <laughs> up six of them have municipal utilities. They're not allowed to do this municipal aggregation. That leaves 96, right? Around 30 odd already have been approved by the Depar uh, Department of Public, Public Utilities, no, DPU, right. They have been approved. They put, the, they put their petition in, that's the word, but their petition has been approved. Um, Greenfield obviously is one. They used uh, a company called Peregrine. I call them coyotes. It's like you're coming across the border from Mexico and you damn well need a guide to get to where <laughs> you're trying to get to, right? I call them that. Um, however, there's a second coyote. There's a company called Colonial out of um, Marlboro, and they did Belchertown. I don't know if you know, but Belchertown's been approved. Uh, there's also some in process, around six. I think Orange is one of the six that's in process. Um, for all, I'm talking about all of, all of the Western Mass now, right? Leverett also is in process. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, they're probably going through the same guy. because um, I think they're with Colonial. Colonial. Right. Um, there are... It's nice that Greenfield's taking the lead on this. Um, I, I stopped in a few days ago to talk to Franklin COG, Council and Governments, and it looks like they are off on the side. They don't really deal with this very much. Uh, and maybe that's a good thing because the Hampshire Council on Government got involved in this <laughs> and it did not go well. <laughs> Just put it that way, okay? So there's, a, like, there's like 40 towns in Western Mass that have never tried. There's the Hampshire crowd that tried and, as I said, it didn't end well. They went out on their own sometimes after, the, after that didn't work and they went through Colonial and they got it. Uh, I was in Hatfield yesterday talking to the town administrator and she said, oh, I got a call this morning from Colonial. We were approved. It just happened. Um, so, I don't know. Thank you. Any Thank other you. questions? So well, so. It's a complicated, it's like killing the elephant. So, just as an example, I mean, I don't know where this all fits in, but Deerfield uh, has a, a quarry up on the north end of town, and that quarry just put some of their scruff, extra scruff land that they haven't excavated, uh, and they've just put a six megawatt system on their leasing the land, and a company from Chicago is building it, and there's, it's all, uh, they've signed up for the municipal cap or whatever it's called. So they're just sell, selling to municipalities. Now, I know the town of Deerfield, because it's here and we've been in communication with Lake Street, which is the company that's doing it, we're going to end up buying a good chunk of our electricity from them. Now, that isn't, it's green, it's produced locally. It's owned by Chicago, somebody in Chicago. I don't know where it fits into this picture, um, but you know, it's another piece of that whole puzzle, which seems to be, it's kind of the Wild West out there, and mm -hmm. everybody's picking variety. Now you have Eversource trying to put solar farms right. up and down the valley. Right, and, and as I pointed out at the hearing, their solar is way more valuable than yeah. mine. <laughs> Uh, there's probably 78, uh, I saw the number 78 um, of outfits that sells electricity around the state. And there's good ones and there's bad ones apparently. And I found on the net at one point a do's and don'ts list of if you're going to go out and buy, you know, retail power from some of these brokers, what to, what to watch out for and, and so on and so forth, which is kind of interesting. I could point to that if, if that's of interest. So any other directions? We've talked about aggregation. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, 
I, I went to a talk uh, about a month ago about community-owned solar, where people can buy solar that's not actually on their property. Mm -hmm. um, this is run through co-op power. They've got this one terrific person who's really energetic and really knows his way around the system. And they're getting lots of people interested in buying this, buying the solar panels. But they need the, the land. They need the place. So, so far the program isn't, as far as I understand, it's not really running yet. I think they and found the place. Did they find a place? I think they're working with Ashfield. Um. That'd be great. Yeah. Yeah, so it doesn't matter where it comes from. You own. to see how that goes because the financing of it is complicated. Yeah, yeah. Nancy and I were involved in something called Scoop. Um, which was a community shared solar cooperative that we were trying to set up in, in it was a group of people from Franklin County that were trying to do it and we got really close we were we were a hair's breadth away but we couldn't make the numbers work and at that point in time most of the Massachusetts incentive programs were expiring and caps were being met and so we couldn't make any long-term promises to the to our to the co-op members, um, but we we have the model, and um, and I'm totally committed to it because I think it's 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 only about 20% of properties that can actually put solar on, on their property, um, whether it's because of. Um, forest, you know, trees or because their roof isn't facing right or their piece of property isn't big enough or they don't own it. There's just, there's lots of reasons. But, so we need to, we need to take that step. We've picked a lot of the low hanging fruit, but if we can, and if we can really have, encourage our legislator and, and to provide incentives, which they, they're getting their act together a little bit more, but, um, We'll know in January what those incentives look like, and we hopefully will be able to move forward on community shared solar, because that is, I agree with you, that is the key piece to how we're gonna really make a dent uh, in locally produced. And I love the idea that it's a locally owned co-op rather than uh, you know, some company from Chicago. No, it, 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 can you is, raise it, it up? Is, if you loosen it down below? Yeah. yeah. It is working there. in there, I checked. Okay, this might be better. Okay, yeah. so, like, I'm here. I came. You think, oh, well, she's interested. She knows what's going on. No, 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 no. I'm like, I'm drowning here with all this information. <laughs> so, the thing I really want to get a point across of, I tend to think of Eversource as the cable company. It's my only choice. I have learned tonight that I can buy my energy from another company. Eversource remains the conduit of how I get it. But that's like, that's like breaking up Ma Bell, you know? And so I think that's the first, that's the first thing we need to tell people, is we need to tell them. It's a very simple thing. You don't have to get your energy through Eversource, that you can get it from a green company or a something else. Start small. Get them to understand that one piece. And then they'll feel a little more empowered, like, wait a minute. I'm just not stuck going to Eversource or the gas company or oil. I have this little choice, this you know, right. spider web in Eversource. And if we can somehow get that word out to the people that aren't pretending to understand like I am, that are at home totally, you know, Right. I think that could be a really powerful thing. Just crack the shell a little bit and teach people that one thing, and it could snowball into something. I think I think it. I th I think that the idea, though, that Greenfield, when the, when when the town offers, when the town says, "Here's where your electricity is coming from. If you yeah. don't want it, you can opt out. But we can get it for you cheaper. It's all green, and we can get it for right. you cheaper than Eversource." That, that is a real, um, an incredible offer. Because if you go and try and buy, um, it's going to cost you more. Right. But Green. The, but the fact is that no one knows you can do that. Yeah. So no. crack, let yeah. them know that. And then when the towns say, 
oh, well, we can get it cheaper. They're like, oh, wait, yes. I yeah. just think that that could be a really good lesson, just one small lesson yep. that, that there are options out there other than just buying from one company and having the conduit be the same company. Thank you. That same inertia that you're talking about is why aggregation is so powerful. Most people stick with their default supplier. And when the default supplier is Eversource, most people stick with them. When, when you change your entire town default supplier to Peregrine or Colonial or somebody else, most people stick with them. So aggregation is the real key to making a difference. Kristen, were you going to speak? Just a little bit of warning, a little information might be dangerous because <laughs> when you look at those lists of power companies you can buy from, some of them are co coyotes in the worst sense of the word. Um, they prey on the elderly and promise them low rates and as soon as they, they buy on and get a contract for one or three years, they jack up the prices. So, um, it, yes, it's freedom to know that you have those choices, but you have to be wise. So the aggregation and putting it in the hands of people who will do the research, um, who have their heart in the right place as far as renewable energy and the best for their community, I think is the way to go. Right. Choice, then when they tell me information, I'll be like, oh, yeah, I know that. Oh, good. They're going to do the work, and I can trust them. Mm. Versus before, I'm like, what are they talking about? And I, I think you reinforce what they should include in their presentations mm. yes, is, you. you know, where people are, uh, their knowledge base is, and what they should include in their presentation mm -hmm. so people can understand this somewhat complicated thing. <laughs> there, are, there are two levels to success here. One is, one is an example of another town's success and showing that much like Greenfield did. Um, the other is just building awareness like you're trying to do and I think a lot of that is an incremental success. You have to go slowly and maybe say, here like say Mass Save is step one, you know, for, to get as many people on board with that because it's a, free, a freebie and it's easy to do and it's successful. Uh, then the next step might be, you know, look into what you can do at your own home uh, for, say, solar panels and whatnot. And then the third step is, is maybe the community uh, thing. But, you know, they, they don't, it doesn't have to be, you know, one after the other. It can be concurrent, but, it can, but I think people need to know uh, what the possibilities are. Um, and there's so many sort of disparate, uh, elements to these things, you know, that you kind of have to bring them together in a way that's clear and understandable and very, you know, look at the, look at the lay person and say, what do they, what do they Bill, know, you know? don't you think that he would make a great member joining <laughs> us on our, on our, on our on a, yes, oh, he's yeah. from Deerfield. What was his name? His name is Jack Cavaco. Oh. <laughs> so Jack would be a, listen to him, he's clearly a member of our team. Yeah, I see that. Thank you, Jack. Yeah. Yeah. To address the point you brought up, um, there are vendors of uh, power and there's, there's other vendors of power. The crowd that sells directly to you is different from the crowd that sells to an aggregate. It's different companies. Right, right. When they sell to you, I believe Eversource can change their prices every three months, right? Six months. I I six. Six. Yeah. Six? six months. They'll be in tune with that, the one that sells to you personally. So you're not gonna get a very long-term commitment, okay? Right. However, when the aggregates work, they're looking for two-year commitments. And the companies, uh, I think, are fairly, well, the, the coyotes know who is reputable and who isn't. I should also add, I just picked up yesterday um, a document from Hampshire COG, and they were talking about a particular supplier that comes through aggregates. It's called Hampshire Power. They're in Northampton, and they are said to be a nonprofit. That's the Hampshire Cog. That's what's in their booklet. I don't have it with me. Yeah. I, had, I picked up four copies. I should have brought one. Uh, yeah, it's one of the many. A colonial will, um, what you see is all these people went through the Colonial Coyote, and they all pick a 
power company, and there's a bunch. Um, there's, there's some in New York, there's here, there, and everywhere, but there's quite a lot that choose Hampshire uh, power in Northampton, maybe because they think they're keeping the money local, maybe because they think, yeah, like a nonprofit, I don't know, but I'm seeing that name crop up a lot, but there's a variety, and they're probably all more reputable than the ones that are selling to individuals, I think. Though there's probably honest ones there, too. Yeah, once again, I'm not saying that any of the law should go out and change over to a different electric company because they now know this. But the fact that that um, we know it can be done, that we have the power, is what will then support us to let somebody else we think will do it better than us do it. Because, oh, if I could do it, you can do it better by all means. Could, yeah. could you say a little bit more about what stood in your way in, in, in your efforts to succeed with a, a co-op power organization? Um, and especially, what do you mean by uh, the cap? Um, so let's make this the last question. That, okay? that, I was going to say, actually, that's a, a full hour to discussion if, if, but, to really understand but, all but those details. Can you, it's the, a can great you talk detail. about what the cap is? Just It's a statewide, it's, it's the Utah. There, there's, there's, um, there's several different caps. There's several different um, things that, that dictate how, like the utility company, how much renewable electricity uh, they need, they must add every year. Um, that's like they can't add. They could add more, but they don't want to. So they say, "Oh, that, that's that's what we've agreed to." That was, and I showed you that slide. That was the renewable energy we, portfolio we need to cap. Take it from one percent to three percent. That slide. Yeah, that's that the slide. And then another issue has to do with this net metering, which we haven't talked about. But if you're a PV uh, maker like Bob is, and, and MA, and uh, do you have PV too? Oh, wow. I'm the only one who doesn't. Um, <laughs> trees. Uh, and I don't have it because of trees and roofs. So I, I really want that community shared solar project. Um, but the, when they generate electricity, they, the price that they pay uh, Eversource for, for that electricity, they also receive for every kilowatt hour that they make. But if I'm a person who's doing community shared solar, I don't get that. I only get the commercial rate, which is 30% less. So that's an economic badness, <laughs> which makes it really hard to make the number. That's just one example. Um, and, and that goes to legislation. So, um, you know, it, uh, the 100% renewables for a campaign that Mass Power Forward is doing, as Bob explained, is, uh, is working within your towns. But once you have that going, you also have a group of people who potentially could weigh in on the legislation. And so I personally am very interested in the legislative side, and if anyone else is interested in that, um, I'd love to talk with you. The fact that we can do these things is because of the power of our legislators. And if you see Steve Kulik or, or Paul Mark or, or Stan Rosenberg, the state legislators, thank them and tell them how important it is. And they, they undergo huge fights between the progressive legislators that want to promote solar and then the legislators that get a lot of money from the utilities who help the utilities set limits on how much solar we can build and how much electricity we can pump into the grid. And so that's what the cap is. It's a limit on the amount of electricity that can be pumped into the grid. Uh, Renew and renewable electricity. Renewable electricity. Yeah, you're right. We're not building coal plants, but <laughs> renewable electricity. And, and, and there is no cap on residential. So, so, you can, so they can't limit the amount that's on your house but there are caps on how much you can have, you know, in a, in a municipal or a commercial Like the uh, community system. shared solar. Like community shared mm -hmm. solar. Mm -hmm. the, the, those are not residential systems. And so they're, they're, they're in the legislation differently. 
Um, but yeah, you know, if you look down in, in Florida, they don't allow solar. It's almost illegal to build solar. I mean, you know, Massachusetts has a really excellent program for allowing us to build solar, but there are limits and the utilities push for lower caps and we're right in the middle of a huge battle trying to pass a new solar bill that will set what the, what the incentives are going to be and the utilities want to completely restructure the way the incentives work from a fairly gender, generous set of incentives to a much less generous set of incentives. And that's being fought out now in the legislation. It's also going to be a hearing session in June. Uh, uh, Senator Pacheco, who's the chair of the Senate uh, Global Warming and Climate Change um, Committee, they're doing a, a sort of a listening and uh, around that renewables uh, you know, piece. Um, I guess they're going to nine different communities, and Springfield and Pittsfield will be the two closest to us in June. So that, that would be a, another place that you can voice your enthusiasm for. Uh, actually, I have a question. So uh, how many of you came could, already knowing that we could get to 100% renewables? Did you feel confident that that could happen? Okay. How many people feel confident now that we could actually achieve it? Well, it's we doubled the number. We doubled the number. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Thank you. So you want to um, wrap up? Yeah, I, I, I thank you all for coming. It's been a, it's been a great conversation. Um, what I would love to have come out of these meetings that we're having in Franklin County is a team, I said this, a team in each town. So any way that we can help you, that you can you know, sort of bring in a couple of friends. We now have a committee of yeah. three. <laughs> and, um, you know, we're going to plan on getting it, you know, enlarging it. And, and uh, so, um, but we, that's, that's the goal. If the, every town in Franklin County has a 100% has renewable team, just the fact that it's called that makes people start believing that there's something going on that's pretty interesting. So the more we can get out, the more PR we can do, the more more whatever in your town or whatever, make noise, start a committee. Don't, the, it can't be the energy committee, they're already too busy, we have to get more people, not just the same people and double their workload. So anything else? Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you.